Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Catalina from Colombia, from the Swiss Red Cross. Uh, I'm representing here all those practitioners that are out there in the field now implementing DRR projects. The ones that are implementing all those strategies no, that have been created or that, that will be created here during this conference. So my presentation is called Experiences from the Field Without a Filter. So it's basically a set of practical ideas that I have kind of represented in a sort of do's and don'ts that if we put them together, we can create the right environment for DRR to flourish. So I'm going to start with the basics. Writing the project proposal. No? First thing that we do with the project. No? So we know that the design phase of the project is very important at the end. But it shouldn't dictate exactly what are going to be the details of the implementation. Because otherwise, this is what we get. And this is what happened with many you know, of the project managers that are, are, are in the field trying to implement projects. We get absolutely crazy. You know? We cannot expect that a consultant that is hired for two weeks or three weeks to write a project proposal can identify clearly what are the priorities of the community. That, in reality, that it doesn't really happen, and we have to you know, like recognize that. So there is a debate between rigid proposals and flexible proposals. So rigid proposals are more, let's say, donor-driven proposals. You know? While if we have flexible proposals, oh, sorry. <laughs> if we have flexible proposals are more owner-driven. More, when I say owner, it could be the community, it could be the municipality, it could be this, the same organization that is implementing. So there is something important in a DRR project. First thing that we do at community level is to do a risk assessment. And what we have after that is a wonderful disaster risk reduction plan with brilliant ideas. If we have a rigid proposal, many times we have very rigid activities and then they don't really match you know, with the activities that we have in the community action plans. So then the problems start there. But if we have a flexible proposal, then we have the capacity to adapt you know, what we have in the proposal to those ideas that have been created by the community. So I mean, by default, it's kind of logic. You know? So the first point that I want to highlight is that we need to do more flexible proposals. We need to rethink you know, like how we can be more, more creative, innovative, and how we can you know, like start to, to adapt, really, to the priorities of the community. The second point, it's about the team. It's all about the team at the end. It's, it's about human resources and the interactions that we have. You know? So I want you to imagine this. There is a disaster. Then, a few months after, you get a job to implement a DRR project. You arrive to the country, very excited, with full of expectations. You meet your team, absolutely wonderful team, no? like with a lot of energy, like, you know, use of technology, but they don't have a clue about the error. Like they don't have idea what is the error. This is what we face. This is the reality. This is what happened many times after a disaster. We arrive to implement projects and we have people no, with a lot of capacities, but no real information about risk factors, about uh, DRR strategies, or risk knowledge in general. That's what we have. So we need to see how we can make sure that we, have, that we can have people that is really capable to implement projects. So we need people capacitated. And capacitated doesn't mean just to have one training and then we just throw them to the field to implement. No, it's a comprehensive knowledge management process. So we really need to rethink how we are designing projects and how are we implementing them. So the call for action here is don't start a project without a capacitated team. Otherwise, we are lost in money and energy and time in this. The third point, it's about partnerships. I know they're a little bit difficult, no, but without partnerships, DRR will never, never flourish. 
if we don't have meaningful partnerships, forget it. There is no sustainability at all. And when I say meaningful partnerships, I'm not talking just about the meetings, no, the coordination that we have, and how good no, is the relation with the local authorities. No, I'm talking about a process. And we're talking about building relations, having a common strategy, having or creating ideas together and implementing them. That is a real partnership. And the problem that we have with many DRR projects is that the partnership just stays in the building relations and having the coordination and great things. So I want to share a very lovely experience, actually. This is Haiti, 2012, in Leogan. This is Philip from the Department of Civil Protection. So this is a very wonderful experience because in a context where we thought that it could be really difficult to do a meaningful partnership, many organizations, well, few organizations, and, and the Department of Civil Protection, we created a really meaningful partnership. We had a very clear strategy together. We said, okay, a strengthening of the DPC was our priority, and we created so many ideas together, and we implemented them. If you go today to Leogan, you can go and talk to Joseph, and he, you can see the impact of a real meaningful partnership. So the call here is to do real partnerships. The next point is a little bit controversial. It's about community-based DRR groups. So my call is no more community-based DRR groups that are not linked to governmental structures. We cannot continue spending money, time, and energy in these community-based DRR groups. We have sometimes many organizations that arrive to the country at community level to create gr group number one, group number two, no? and at the end it's just confusion. No, there are in this moment 121 countries with official DRR structures, and our responsibility as organizations is to make sure that we contribute to this process, that we know that it's not perfect, no? like we know that many things no? like to improve and to go, but if we create parallel groups that are not linked to the government, we're just jeopardizing like, the, the strategy of the government. I want to share a baseline that we did last year in Philippines. So we ask to the communities, not to the, to the population, like, do you know that there is a DRR committee in your village? Only 18, 18% 18 of them say yes in Philippines. That is a country that actually they have done really well in the era, no? But in the area where I'm based, only 18% answer, which means no, that there is still a way to go. So we have a responsibility as organizations to support the government to increase that number. If we create a parallel group at the community, we're just damaging this and jeopardizing this process. So the call for action is do more to support the government DRR strategies. And my last point, very important, is about knowledge management. It's about lessons identify and lessons learn. And for this, I cannot talk without talking about Mickey Glantz, who is actually here in yellow. He's a Mickey Glantz from Boulder University. He's a big advocate to the fact that we are not learning enough from the lessons that have been learned, that we need a steel you know, to, to learn from the lessons that have been identified. There are thousands, like seriously, thousands of documents you know, on best practices, cases, studies, all kind of documentation. And the question is like, are we really learning out of them? Like, it's like really from a very practical, like practitioner point of view, no yet. We're not really learning, no? But it's not because we don't want, of course we want to learn. But the reality is that we don't have time to go through the 2,000 documents that are in Prevention Web, and we don't have, and, and that is linked to a very important point that is quality, no? Like, what is good out there, no? Like, there are like so many documentations is there a filter that can tell us, okay, this is really good or this is really bad? There is no there. So we have a challenge. 
like all of us, like all the organizations, to figure it out how we are going to start to use those lesson learned. Because in this moment, we cannot afford continue, you no know, like just doing projects and doing projects without really learning from that. So the last call is don't ignore the lessons identified and learn from them. So to summarize these five points, no, so I'm going to show it to you. I want you to really take this message to your jobs, to your houses, and think you know, like how we can really meaningful change this. So the first one, two more flexible proposals, please. Don't start a project without a capacitated team. Otherwise, it won't work, never. Don't do real partnerships. Do more to support the government strategies. No more parallel community-based GR groups. That doesn't work. And don't ignore the lessons identified and learn from them. Thank you. <laughs>